kind of work with Lord for this one? I do. And um, so uh, I went to, if you guys might want to look at here just a minute, I went to a conference oh. this weekend, and it was for women in ministry, and it was amazing, and God poured into us, and God showed up, and on my way home, um, I got in the traffic jam, and I was listening to Caleb, and just going along, and by the time I got to Oak Ridge, I was tired, so I stopped, and when I got back on the road, um, I was about to turn Caleb back on, and God said no, and God said, I just, I just want I just want to talk to you for a minute. And so God gave me this message for the church today. Um, and it's been burning inside of me since yesterday. So I'm really excited to get to tell you guys this. So in the song um, that we're going to do, it's called Raise a Hallelujah. And God just showed me a couple of things about this song yesterday that are really awesome. So, um... Down in verse 2, um, it says, I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. And God showed me that the mystery is the things that we're going through. Is there anyone here today that is going through some tough stuff? Financial problems, if you're in the middle of financial problems, you're in the middle of a mystery right now, right? You don't know how it's going to end. If you have um, problems with family or spouse or if there's something, um, a doctor's diagnosis, you know, anything going on and you're standing in the middle of that, that's your mystery right now. And God's saying, I don't want you just to sit back and wait for the answer to come. I want you to do something about it. So when we sing, I raise a hallelujah, we're not just standing here saying, I raise a hallelujah. When you raise a hallelujah, you're raising praise to God. And God wants you to praise him in the middle of, his, of your mystery right now. In the middle of what you don't know the answer to, God's saying, I want you to praise me now because I'm already there. I'm already working on the outcome. Even if the outcome doesn't look like what you want it to look like, God's saying, I'm there, and I'm doing it, and it's the best thing for you. And I want you to stand on your feet today, and I want you to raise a hallelujah, and I want you to praise me in the middle of whatever is going on. Sorry. <laughs> this, has been, this has been like 24 hours, you guys, so sorry. So, um, so that's what we're going to do today. We're not going to sing this song. We're going to get on our battle armor, and we're going to tell the enemy, you don't get to be a part of this mystery. You don't get to bring fear. You don't get to do anything. And what I'm going through, I'm giving it to God, and I am going to trust him for the outcome. So let's stand up today, and let's raise a hallelujah to God today. Amen? Amen.
this morning. God, you are worthy. You are worthy. Lord, I pray that, God, that we would all, would, we would all recognize we need to worship with intercessory worship. That we need to worship not just for ourselves or because it's the song that we prefer, but we would worship so that everybody around us would know that we love you, Jesus, and you're more important to us than any other thing. And God, we glorify and magnify and lift you up. We lift you up, oh God, because you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Sharon, would you come here and share that word that you gave in the prayer room? I think it's so vital. It won't take long because I'll cut her off. <laughs> The Lord has been dealing with me in the last few weeks. When we come and we sing praises <laughs> to the Lord, we need to listen to what we're singing. We need to hear what he's saying in those songs. When we do and when we praise him through those songs, through those words, they were put there for our history. They were put there so that we could be lifted up. Jesus loves us and he wants to raise us up. He doesn't want us to live in a valley anymore. I guess I've shared a little more than I did in the prayer room this morning, but I feel his presence. When we turn around and we give him what he is due, then he will be glorified and he will be lifted up. And that's what we're here for. That's what sinners will come in and receive from the Lord when we're praising him. When they see us lifting his name up, then they're going to look what we have. Right. We're not a dead church, people. We're a live church in Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He gave us eternal life that we can live for him and be victorious in our walk with the Lord.
I remember when we started exercising this at Newport Assembly, and, and our prayer room uh, was actually right behind the platform, and we actually had a hallway back there, and there was a prayer room over here. It had some of those cool pews in it and stuff, and, uh, and then we had a couple classrooms, and anyways, and what I can remember one Sunday, it was my turn to go to the prayer room. It was my turn to be in the prayer room, and I can tell you, it was like everybody else. Oh, man, I'm going to be out in the service. <laughs> but I went and did my job, and I'll tell you something. I was in the prayer room, and there was, and I was like, I'm just like, wow, I, I wish I could see what's going on, because God was kicking some tail in the prayer room. I mean, I was getting energized. I was getting excited. I was, man, it was like, man, I'm like, I can go through that wall. Have you ever felt that in God? Like if you look through concrete walls? If you ever see a dent in one of the concrete walls around here, it was me trying. <laughs> Presumptions, not authority. Anyways. Well, I'll tell you what. I've had several times in my life where I've gone under the anointing of the, of the Lord. In my, it's usually in my intercessory worship time. And I'm energized in God and I'm going for God. And I'm, and I'm just really getting into it. And I just feel like I can just crush through anything. And here's the deal. If God tells me to, I will crush through anything. I'm not going to be shy about that. I'm not telling you that God's telling us to run through walls. If you have your Bible with you, would you turn to Josiah, not Josiah, but to 2 Kings chapter 22. If you have the book of Josiah, you have an interesting Bible. You might have the book of Hesitations if you have the book of Josiah. <laughs> Hesitations 3.5 is one of my favorite. My mom asked me one time, she said, what is your favorite verse? And I said, can I just ask why? I was at Fred Meyer's work man, and, you know, back in the days of those wonderful three-piece suits that choked me to death while you're working. Of course, we're suit. Anyways. And I'm walking, I'm in the toy aisle, actually, and I'm walking through, and I'll never forget, I came out those uh, stockroom doors, and I'm just walking through, and she says, hey, what's your favorite verse? I said, that's easy, kill them all, like God's talking about, hesitation, three, five, and there's this long pause, because she, she's at ministry training, too, and there's this long pause, and she goes, nuh-uh. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm, I'm kidding, my bad. God is good. He's so good to us. You know, he's good to us whether we're holding a cup of coffee or not. He's good to us whether we do it the way somebody else did or not. He loves us with an undying love. And you know what? When your kid comes in and they're wearing an outfit that just scares the bejeepers out of you. <coughs> And I don't, I'm not mature enough to know whether you can even say bejeebers in church and not get killed. You know, I'm kidding, I hope. But actually, really don't know what it means. Probably shouldn't use that if I don't know, right? Here's the deal. Jos Josiah's report it starts in 2 Kings 22. Let's see. I don't want to read the whole thing because we don't have enough time for that. You can go and read the whole thing, but 2 Kings 22, and King Josiah, King Josiah comes on the scene. He's eight years old. Eight. And this kid is on fire for God. Eight. Yes. I love that. Eight years old. Anyways, as he's developing the things of the Lord, and he's going on, the first, one of the first things he does is he tells them, and I, I don't know, he's like 13 or 16 or something at this point, I don't remember. Anyways, he go and he goes to the, the um, he calls the leaders of the temple and stuff, and he says, hey guys, how's the remodel job going on the temple? Well, sir, we're not really doing that. He said, what are you doing with the money? Well, sir, we're just piling it up. I love what he does. He's so bold. I love him. Josiah says, get all the money. Take it and give it to the people that are going to rebuild the temple. Stop hoarding it. Stop using it for whatever you want, whatever. 
But you go and you use it, you give it to the workers, and they need to rebuild the temple. And then he does what he's supposed to do. Later on, he calls them to an account again, and he says, now tell me how the work is going. Because you see, in business, we learn don't expect what you don't inspect. And it's the same in your own lives. Don't expect what you don't inspect. You send your kid to go clean the room, and what are they doing? They're playing with the toys. I'm still that way. I go to clean my room, my office. I get in there. I find toys I forgot I had. Is that the same for your office? I got stuff in there. Just like, oh, yeah, my Hebrew study. Oh, man. I just, and I'll get out. I'm, I'm in it. So much for cleaning the rest of it because now I'm back in doing what I love to do, which is study the word. If you want it clean, I'd almost say just go clean it. But then I'd never find it. It's like a man's garage, right? Or a lady's uh, sewing area. How many of you ladies want your husband to go clean up your sewing room? Now, some of y'all are quite well organized and amazing. And some of you do it the way I do. I know it's under there somewhere, and I'll find it someday. It's like Easter egg hunting. So he tells them to remodel the, the tabernacle, fix the damages. And I love what it says. And they found the book of Moses. And they're like, oh, 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 wow. Look what we got. Wow. And because they knew Josiah was a man of God, they bring it to Josiah and they go, listen up, okay? And they start reading it. And he, and, he, and he hears what's being said, and it cuts him to the quick because he loved the Lord with all of his heart, and he, and he wanted the best for his land. He wanted the best for those that were entrusted to him, and he tears his clothes, and he gets on the ground, and he starts weeping before God, and he says, I'm so sorry. He truly repents, and he truly asks God to forgive, and he truly realizes they need God's help. And they read it to the king, and the king tears his clothes. He gives the command for them to go inquire of the Lord. He says, for me and the people. This is actually verse 12 and 13, so I can back up here. I guess I already got it up, huh? Verse 12 and 13 says, When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded. Notice he commands. He doesn't go, hey guys, it'd be really nice if you would go do this for me. No, he's a king. You know what I love about it? Is he actually acts like one. He doesn't act like one of those spineless leaders who says, if you don't care, we all just get along. He does the right thing. He commands them. And he, the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah, Asiah, whatever his name is, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath, the thumos of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the word of this book. Do according to all that is written concerning us. Do it all. Do it all. Then they go to hold us the prophetess. Hold the prophetess and, and, and they ask her what is going to happen and she says well God is going to smash you guys you're going to be wiped off the map he's going to lick you up with somebody you're going to get the tar kicked out of you. you you know enough is enough and it shall not be quenched it is an irrevocable irreversible a, a word of destruction well don't you want to hear that don't you want God to send you a text or an email saying, you know what, I've just had enough of you. <laughs> Get ready for the bam, right? That's what, you know. But here's the deal. There's a cool thing here. There's a cool thing that we need to take to heart today. It says this, but to the king of Judah, this is Josiah, 
but to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel regarding the words which you have heard, because your heart has been tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me. Truly, I have heard you, declares the Lord. And we don't get this as Westerners, because if we tear our clothes, we think, we'll be dang. I've got 500 shirts in my closet. Becky would say amen. It's not 500. I just don't get, a, get rid of some because I figure someday I might accidentally fit those again. And then I've got the ones just in case Thanksgiving was too long. See, we don't get it. When he tore his clothes, he was probably tearing clothes that possibly even his father's 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 into the time of David may have been wearing. When he tore those clothes, he wasn't just tearing clothing. He was tearing family clothes. He was tearing clothes that not even though he was a king, you would still have. I mean, if you went out as a king and you went out in kingly robes and you went out to do kingly business, you were probably wearing stuff from the time of David, possibly, or even Solomon. Who knows? But the point is, when he tore his clothes, everybody went, whoa. See, if you tear your clothes, you're just like, man, you're a freak. I was going to wear a shirt that buttons up so I wouldn't break it when I went like this. But you see, he honestly and sincerely repented. He honestly and sincerely wanted God's favor for him and the people of God. Number one, for him, because if God's favor is on him, he's going to rule well, and that will be good for the people. And he wanted God's favor on the people because it's good for the people. Makes sense, right? That's why God wants us to be reformed. That's why he wants us to be revived. That's why he wants us to have the, the, the fire of revival to light up in us. You like it when there's a fire under you, right? Some of you, can't look at anybody when you say this. Some of you, it's been a long time since there's been a fire lit under you. Some of us, we've had a lot of fires lit, lit, lit under us. Sometimes we light our own fire. Oh boy, that one hurts. But I want God to light our fire. I want God to light our fire so that we would start looking at life, at what can I, what can I take to, to, with me to the end. It's like the guy that gets to heaven with a backpack full of gold, and St. Peter starts going, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and the guy goes, what? St. Peter says, well, I've never had anybody show up with asphalt before. Because, <laughs> you know, in heaven, the gold is clear as glass. It's the best of the best. And this guy, sh you know, shows up with the earthly gold, which is not even close. But it, do you see this? Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord. Notice it doesn't say because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before everybody else. No, it's because you humbled yourself before the Lord. There's a big difference. Who cares if you're humble in front of everybody else? Except for how it affects your witness, yes. But if you humble yourself before the Lord in, the, in your closet, in your prayer closet, if you humble yourself before the Lord and you're doing something in the humility of what God has gifted you to do, if you're doing that, God is so well pleased and refreshed and he hears you. And he says the same because your heart is tender and you humbled yourself. And when you heard what I spoke against this place, against the inhabitants, that they should become a desolation, a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, truly, I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I'll gather you to your fathers, and you will be put or go to peace.
chapter 23 goes into Josiah's reforms, and in chapter 23, he re, he reestablishes uh, re the covenant with God. And and, I, and if I hear it right, and I, it was kind of hard to dig out, but it looks like Josiah is the one now reading these scriptures that they have found to the other people, including the priests, the prophets, and all the people, small and great. In Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 13, it's, it's the law, and King Josiah makes a great covenant with the Lord in, in verse 3, and to keep his commandments, to keep his testimonies, to keep his statutes. Tell me about God's commandments. Are any of God's commandments bad? Really? You're right. <laughs> Good answer. Does God make bad commandments? Why? <laughs> right. No hits, no runs, no errors. No. No, he has hits and runs, and he still has no errors. Right? He never makes a bad commandment at all, ever. In fact, he's immutable, which means he can't, not only is he unchangeable, but quite frankly, he has no reason to change. Right? There's people who say, well, he did go on to the Old Testament. He was the meaner. And then there was God. There was Jesus in the New Testament. He changed Moses into God of the New Testament, Jesus. And then now the God of the, of the, the, the new time is he, he turned into the spirit of God. That's called modalism, and almost nobody believes it. You know why? Because you, you can't. At the baptism of Jesus, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the same spot at the same time doing different things but all together. And it shows that the Trinity of God is a real thing. But the point is, is that God is on our side and he declares that if we will follow him with all of our heart, if we will keep his commandments. And remember that keep his commandments, it's out of love. Make that heart. Can you make a heart? Out of love. God wants you to serve him out of love, amen? amen? God does not want you to serve him because somebody throws stuff at you. God doesn't want you to serve him because you think it's a good idea. Although it's, you might start that way, honestly. You know, if you go out to battle and you see a way to survive, that's a good idea, right? You start with a good idea and then you figure out, hey, this is actually the right way to do it. That's okay. It's okay to engage the brain. God didn't save you so you could leave your brain at the door. He saved you so with your own heart, with your whole being, you can serve him. He says, keep my commandments, my testimonies, my statutes with all of his heart and soul, and to carry out these words of this covenant that were written in this book. Hallelujah. And all the people entered into the covenant with Josiah. In 2 Chronicles 34, boy, jump a little bit farther. And you have to get into Kings and Chronicles because it has the same story. But in 2 Chronicles 34, in verse 32, it says this. I love this about Josiah. <laughs> Moreover, now he's being a king here, he's being a good leader. He made, he made, he made all the people who are present in Jerusalem, Benjamin, to stand with him. You see, he said, come to the altar. And if they didn't come to the altar, well, he made them come to the altar. Now, I'm not trying to be weird here. I'm just telling you he's a good king. You know, there's, they say that there's good leaders and there's great leaders. And a great leader is somebody who takes people where they should be. He was making them go where they should be in right relationship with God. Now, does that totally work out? Oh, no. Some people are just doing it because they don't want to get hurt. But you know what? Is there not enough stupid being law, put in the law in our land that is just, it's such foolishness that they're, they're enacting and, and stuff, and they're just saying, you know what? If we just make it legal, it'll be 
Southern tribe. Jesus from the Southern tribe of Judah. But the top ten tribes, well, if you were looking at it, the top ten tribes, they have already been dispersed for years. They've already been gone for a long time. The Assyrians took them away in, in uh, what was it, 786 or 782, whatever it was BC. Here's the deal. Josiah has the audacity, the boldness of God to go clear up into where those top ten tribes used to be. There's now five other people groups that have been put there by the Assyrians. And Josiah has the guts to be a real king of Judah again. To actually send his people up and to destroy all of the false worship centers even in the northern tribes. Gotta yell. Because he was as good as dead in some people's eyes for that. He destroyed those false calves that were made. He destroyed a lot of things. In fact, what I love about him is he didn't, he didn't throw them out of the city like Manasseh did. No, that just drives me nuts. Manasseh took a, the false gods of his fathers and the false gods of himself. And when he came to the Lord and was restored, he took them outside the city and threw them in the dung heap. He, anyways, Josiah, the difference of Josiah is he goes and he grinds them, he crushes them, burns them, and grinds them to powder, and then throws them away. You know why? Because he doesn't want the people to go back to what's going to kill them later. Dr. Carly used to tell us this in, in one of our classes. And he said this. He said, kill what is going to kill when you are strongest in God, kill what's going to kill you when you're going to be weak. You know why? Because you're going to have times of weakness and you're going to have times of great strength. Amen? It's just true. I don't know if saying that's the right word there. But the point is, is you're going to have good and bad times. You're going to have times when you're strong and times when you're a wimp. When you're spineless before the enemy or, or when you're just going to give in. But I love what he said. When you are strongest in God, destroy what's going to get you when you're weak. And you know, I start, that's where I learned how to get my big 24-ounce waffle hammer, my framing hammer, and I just started going through my house. You know what I did? I pulled out videos. As soon as I thought of a, you know, one of my favorite ones that had one bad thing in it, one. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want that in my house. So I just smashed it immediately. And I'll never forget my kids. They were twingers at the time. My oldest kids, not these three. But anyways, and I remember them saying, but Dad, that was your favorite movie of all time. And I go, I know. You see, I was killing what was strong in God. I was smashing what was going to smash me when I was weak. Just a really good principle. Get yourself a framing hammer if you don't have one. However, it breaks for cheap. He made all who were present stand with him. And in verse 33, he made all who were present to serve the Lord throughout his lifetime. Hallelujah. And they did not turn from following the Lord during his lifetime, the God of their fathers. And in chapter 23, 2 Chronicles 23, so going back the other way, some of the reforms he brought, and actually also into chapter 35, I'm going to back up a little bit, but the reforms of the Josiah was that he sent the priests back in their offices. Because you see, the people were false, they were following false religions, and they were doing even God, even religion, ah, sorry, they were even worshiping Yahweh in false ways, and so Josiah got rid of all those, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, and he encouraged them and to serve in the house of the Lord, this is talking about the priests that Josiah put into place, he funded them and made sure that they were taken care of. You know why? Because when they're not funded, they've got to go out and get a job and quit doing what God made them to do. God created them to do. And he sanctified the priests. He made them sanctify themselves and be ready for the work. And then he replaced the holy ark in the temple of God. 
And he commanded them to clean out the temple of God from all the false worship objects that were in there. They had gone so far that they had started to decorate and set up, they set up uh, shrines to false gods in the temple of God.
your humility, you will not see me. Back in 2 Chronicles 23, 25, before Josiah, no former king was like him nor after who turned to the Lord with all of his heart and soul, with all of his might according to all the law of Moses. I want to be a history maker. Don't you? I don't want to just be another person that lives. Who cares? Heck, I don't give a rip what they do with my name. I don't care if they remember my name. But I want to do everything I was created for, don't you? I want to be so refreshing to the Lord that he just can't stand it anymore. But I don't, I don't want him to take me a moment early, and I don't want him to leave me a moment long late. Right? I'm not trying to be weird about this. I'm just telling you. I want to go see Jesus. I'm saying, Maranatha, come on. I can hear the trumpet sound. Jesus says, Jesus sings. Oh, man. I want to hear it. But here's the problem. We have millions of people in our day right now. Millions and millions, actually billions of people right now in our day that have not heard an excellent understanding of who their creator is. They've never met their creator. They have not met the Lord for who he is. They have not known him for who he is. They have not seen him for who he is. And I love this. In this uh, Matthew 22, 36, the guy comes up, one of the warriors of the law, and he says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And, and Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You know, I think that kind of covers everything. Right? Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, body, spirit, everything. Love him with everything. You know what that means? I don't have it on me. But that means everything you have is the Lord. That you, when you come to the Lord, that whatever you have is His. It's like when your engine acts up and you're driving along. I've had, I've done this so many times now in my life since I've been especially in ministry, where I'm just driving along, and especially when I'm on one of those long multi-hour trips to a hospital in Portland or wherever it is. And, and something acts up and the light comes on or whatever, and I just go, God, it's your car. It's your deal. I had, a, I had a tire blow out on a trailer one time. I said, well, God, it's your trailer. And he put on my heart. He says, pull into this Les Schwab. I was going to pull into a different tire place. He says, pull into this Les Schwab. So I did. And I'm going, God, it's your, it's your deal. I'm your kid. This is your deal. You know, I don't... We don't have money to replace something like that. I can tell the tire had killed itself. It was a multi... Anyway, it was one of several tires on the trailer. I pull into this Les Schwab, unbeknownst to me, one of my good friends' sons is one of the lead people at that Les Schwab, and he was just leaving the... the as I pulled in, with this big old... Tra as I pulled in, and, and he was... As he was leaving to go to lunch... He walks over, and he says, Pastor Norm. Well, you see, I had gotten to lead him to the Lord years before. I hadn't seen him in a long time. He says, what are you doing? I said, oh, man, we just had a tire blow up. I think it might be pretty bad. He goes back there, and he comes back, and he goes, oh, it's, it's gone. It had even taken some of the lug nuts off and everything. It tore it up. You know, if I would have turned to the wrong place, I wouldn't have seen him. You know what he did? He got all the parts together and stuff, and he put the bill for it, and we left there with a totally new wheel and tire, and it didn't cost us anything but a good hug and a prayer. Oh, yeah. It pays to listen. It pays to listen. Can't tell you how many times I was out in the boonies, and I had gone to a hospital call or something like that, and I was coming back, and... And I'd forgotten to get gas while I was still in Portland, and, you know, and money was tight. Anyways, and I'm coming back, and I'm driving my old 96 Range Rover. Or, or, or. You know, they were not designed to be good on gas, but I'll tell you what, they're great in the country. You can find everything. It's fun. 
I'm coming back, and all the gas stations are closed. I came on fumes. And one time I prayed my way from Hermiston or Hebner, I think it was Hebner, all the way to Monument. And I was praying and praying and praying. I'm putting it in neutral and I'm doing all those things you do. And I get up to my house, which has a rise up to the house, and I get into our driveway, and it's like an eighth of a mile, and you know, into where our house was. And I get up the hill, and just as I glide up to the back door of the house, the engine goes, blah, 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 blah. It's midnight. I don't know why I'm telling you this. There was other times when <laughs> the guys were little, the cupboards were bare, the refrigerator li literally had almost nothing in it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sinking feeling. And the Lord challenged us to not use other means for our food supply and stuff, but to, to, to uh, just wait upon Him and not. And we didn't tell anybody, nobody knew. And the next morning, I kid you not, we open up the door, and there's bags of groceries. All the things we wanted were out there on the, the front porch. And people were bringing us vegetables and stuff. And then one of the guys who's a rancher said, uh, Brother Don, Don Haven. He said, Pastor, how much beef you got in that freezer? And I was used to being the one that was giver, not the giver, not the one receiving. So it was really awkward for me, and I wouldn't answer. And Becky, he goes, Becky, what you guys got in the freezer? She goes, oh, you'll have to look or something like that. And so he comes right to the house. She gave him permission. He comes right in the house. He opens up our, our, our freezer, then our fridge, after he saw the freezer was almost empty. Anyways, then he goes out to the deep freeze, and he checks it out. And it's got a bunch of junk in there from somebody else. But anyways... And it's, you know, vacant. The next thing we know, he comes back with a carload of stuff. You know, he only had a few miles of land, and he was a big rancher. But we didn't tell anybody. We were just waiting on the Lord. <laughs> and he kept doing that stuff. We didn't want to be history makers. We don't want to be the ones that aren't doing what we've been told when the Lord shows up. Amen? We want to be the ones that have been about His business. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. One of these two commandments, on these two commandments, depend the whole law and the prophets. There was a man in Jesus' day who, who said this, well, this is part of it, but there was a man who said, Lord, what do I do to enter into life? And Jesus simply said this. He said, follow whatever he said, my commandments. Follow what I say. Matthew 22, 9 says, go therefore to the main highway, that as many as you find there, invite them to the feast. And he said to let not one of us get to the highways and get our job done. That means, that means it's not okay to have lazy boy attachment disorder. It's, it's okay to be in a lazy boy. I, I, I think we might still have one. But it's okay to use one. It's not okay to abuse one. God wants us to get out there. And here's the reason why. It's because the Lord is coming back and the enemy is fighting hard. And he's trying really hard to kill, steal, and destroy everything that God wants his people to have. One last scripture, I think. James 5. James 5, verse 19. My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth, one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It's kind of the get out of jail free card for this week, right? <laughs> you know what? God just wants us to try. You know what I love about scriptures like this? God wants us to be about helping each other to thrive. God is not looking for you to be perfect, by the way. A 
other hand in love. God is not looking for you to do everything without any margin of error. What I know is this, is the more I know, the more I realize I don't know much. Like the old saying, you ask a kid before they go to college, what do you know? They say everything, right? Don't they? That's why they have that sign. <laughs> While you know everything, hurry up and get out and get a job. Fend for yourself. But the second year, when they come back from college, you ask them the same question, what do you know? And they go, oh, I know a lot. I know a lot. And they come back from the fourth year of college, and they say, what do you know? And they say, I don't know anything. You know why? Because the more you're educated, the more you understand, there is so much more beyond you that you don't know. And you know what? They're saying it's doubling now. I think it's every 11 hours. All knowledge in the world is doubling. Is that weird? It's crazy. Every 11 hours. You know, there's only one knowledge you need. As far as you need, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know him as Lord and Savior. You need to walk with him as Lord and Savior. And you need to know that God wants to revive your land. God wants to revive the land of your heart, your life, your mind. God wants to revive your family. God wants to revive Lapine and the greater area. God wants to revive Oregon. Oh man, do we need it bad? God wants to revive the West Coast. God wants to revive and bring revival to the whole Northwest region. He wants to bring revival to the whole world. Because it's not long until the trumpet sounds and there'll be a great apostasy. We get that. But what he's asking us today is, will you let him revive you? Will you? Will you let him revive you? Will you let him turn up the fire of the Spirit of God in your life unto repentance and transformation and change so the whole world will want to come walk with Christ? And I'll leave you with this. You can go research it for yourself. This morning I was listening to the Welch Revival. It's one of my favorite revivals to research because they changed so much that even the kids that, that took care of the Shetland ponies, and I think there was donkeys and stuff involved, but in order to get them down into the mines, into the caverns, they had these little animals. Anyways, they had a problem because when everybody started getting revival and everybody started changing, even people found that they were afraid to do anything other than be with God on God's day. And so anyway, there was such a change in their whole culture of community that they, their productivity in the coal mine went down. And you would say, well, wait a minute. If God got a hold of them, shouldn't it have got better? No, the animals didn't respond anymore because they weren't being cussed to. <laughs> being serious. They had to retrain the animals how to do what they were told without a little extra twist. Wasn't that funny? You know what that says to me? All of creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Who in your creation, who in your influence, who is it that God is wanting to influence through you so they can know their most basic human rights? That they can know their, their creator, Jesus Christ. Who is it? Think about that, please. Think about who it is God is putting on your heart right now to go talk to them about the Lord. Maybe you can invite them to come to Easter. You can invite them to come to Blessed Provides. That's May 30th. You can invite them to come to the Back to School Bash. You can invite them to come to, you know, Food Fights. Only in my dreams. But wouldn't it be cool to have an altar of Food Fights? Yeah. It would. That's me. I'm writing it into my funeral. Food fight necessary. We're going to have meatballs. God loves you. And he's given me a love for you. And he wants you to have so much more than what we can have. In other words, he wants us all to let him turn up the fire of revival in our life so high. That when we get around others, they go, man, is it warm in here? Right? It's like I was talking to one of my family members the other day who was going through just a horrible situation. What am I saying? She's just going through a heart-wrenching situation. 
Would you stand? 